Hello and welcome. My name is Deborah Diebel and I'm the site manager at the Outdoor Education Centre. I am here to share some ideas with you for getting your kids outside this summer. And so I have a presentation I'm just going to bring up on the screen and I'll share some ideas with you. So this is one of my passions, so I'm really happy to be here to chat with you about different things you can do with kids of all ages. And I want to thank L Lauren Penner Lipset for the invitation to do so with you today. Before we start, the Blue Water District School Board and myself always like to acknowledge that our school communities reside on the traditional land of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, which is represented by the communities of Saugeen First Nation and Chippewas of Nawash Unceded First Nation. We also acknowledge the Métis Nation of Ontario, whose history and people are well represented in Bruce and Grey counties and who have definitely contributed to our region. So the goals for the presentation today are threefold. First, just to remind ourselves of why the effort to get our families outside pays off. Um, and then to share some unique ideas, both for families who spend lots of time outside already and might be exploring new areas, and then just some fresh and new ideas and new perspectives for exploring those familiar places as well, for those of us who are sticking closer to home this summer and visiting our old favorites. So the dream and then maybe the reality. So some of you might be feeling a little hesitant. We have this awesome um, goal coming into the summer to get our kids outside and to spend time with them. And we're dreaming of these picture perfect moments where we're all shiny, happy people and everyone's excited and we're laughing and giggling and having fun and everyone's getting along and we go home happy and there's no bug bites and the weather cooperates and everything's awesome. But deep down, some of us might have some concerns or fears or hesitation because, oh, my kids, they love to spend so much time on their cell phones. I'm not sure how I'm going to drag them outside. Or I really don't like the bugs. I don't like the heat. I'd rather be inside where the air conditioning is and just save myself the effort. Or, oh, man, getting those kids in the car, the first 10 minutes is always a fight. I don't know if it's worth it. Maybe it's just talk to the hand mom. I'm not interested. I have other things I want to do this summer. Well, for all of you, I hope I'll be sharing some ideas to reconnect with your kids and to help them spark some new interest and curiosity this summer so that they want to be outside and hopefully outside with you as a family. So let's just remind ourselves, why is this important? There's definitely a growing um, body of evidence and a growing chorus of scientists and edu educators that have acknowledged, especially through the pandemic, that importance of getting outside. Really being locked down at times and isolated has drawn our attention for that need um, for connection, not only with our families and our friends and neighbors, but also feeling connected to nature and feeling connected to ourselves. A lot of us kind of reevaluated and did some thinking over the times of the pandemic when we were at home. And now getting that perspective of being outside and reconnecting with what's important outside of home is also really important. Being outside in nature can reduce stress, anxiety, and symptoms of attention deficit disorders. It helps us get the wiggles out, helps our brains focus in, and it's really important for us to see that big blue sky and breathe in fresh air once in a while. It enhances our sense of well-being, gratitude, and perspective. I know if I'm worried about something or mulling something over, I love to just go and sit at a favorite spot on the shores of Georgian Bay, and being by that vast body of water makes me feel really small in a really, um, a really nice kind of way, um, and it just brings such a sense of perspective to me. So I would love for all of our, our children to have that as well. It does improve academics. There are scores of studies showing that academic performance can be improved by spending time in nature. And for those of us who are finding our kids kind of became a little apathetic maybe during COVID, they lost interest in some of the things that normally got them really jazzed up. Being outside sparks that curiosity again. There's always serendipitous things happening um, that can bring up new questions and help them get excited about things again. It's a real tangible experience. So exploring new areas will help them get in touch with that sense of curiosity again. Physical health is also boosted by being outside. So I have this picture of kids getting down in the mud. There's growing bodies of research that show the microbes in the soil that we get from gardening or building sandcastles 
are really important to our gut biome and that connects to our emotional and uh, mental health as well. And then of course, physical fitness, coordination, movement, um, inner ear development and balance is really developed, especially when kids are young, by walking on uneven surfaces, doing inversions, being up on monkey bars, hanging over logs, all of those things that kids love to do naturally. So following their lead can be really important. So how can I get my kid outside this summer? I understand, I've been reminded it's important. I really wanna do it, I'm keen to get them out. It's really important just to have that mentor, somebody who gets them excited and wants to share that time with them. So with you, with a grandparent, a trusted adult, an aunt or uncle, having that person that can mentor them and get them excited is also a good idea. So inviting friends along is a lot of fun. How do we combat the boredness? <laughs> I know um, when I was growing up, my mom would do really well with us being at home until about week eight and then I would hear her start saying oh I can't wait to get these kids back to school. So I've tried to line up some new and unique ideas for you. So here we are just after the solstice. It was the trifecta. It was the first day of summer, summer solstice and also National Indigenous Peoples Day has been designated for June 21st. So it's a great time to kind of take stock and set your goals for getting outside in the summer and also reconnecting with First Nations culture in our area. There were celebrations at Saugeen First Nation and that's going to be continued. Hooray, powwows are back, in-person gatherings are back. So something you can think about for later in the summer for getting outside and reconnecting with a culture that's also very connected with nature would be going to one of these powwows. So August 13th and 14th at Saugeen First Nation, there will be a powwow. And then at Neishingaming, um, some of you will know it as Cape Croker, their powwow is August 20th. And what a great way to connect with people who've connected with the land for so long. I've tried to incorporate, like I said, ideas for all ages. So here I'll just explain quickly a few of these ideas. So the top two um, photos are showing a game called Firekeeper and Fire Snatchers, or just Mama and Baby Deer. So um, all of these games are to ignite the use of senses other than sight. Often we are so focused on sight that we forget to um, notice nature using our other senses, like our sense of smell and sense of hearing. So the top one, the Fire Snatchers game, basically you do need a few people for this, but it's a lot of fun for people of all ages and you can ramp up the level of challenge. So one child sits in the middle blindfolded and you put something in front of them that makes a lot of noise. So I like to use my keys because they jingle jangle and the other kids sit around them in a circle. And then you as the adult um, mediate so that you're choosing one or two of the children in the outside circle who are not blindfolded to sneak up on the fire keeper in the middle and try to snatch that fire or baby deer away from them without the fire keeper or mama deer in the middle knowing that they are coming. So practicing on the grass or the turf like the top right photo first and then building up to being in nature where there's sticks that can break and leaves that crumple is a way to escalate the activity a little bit um, but basically the person in the middle gets to point if they hear a noise and if they are correct the people sneaking in have to go back to the outside circle and you give them maybe seven tries to try to catch someone so they're not just constantly pointing off in all directions um, but hopefully they catch the sneakers or the fire snatchers and if somebody is successful at snacking or snatching that uh, fire away they get to then be the fire keeper in the middle so that opens them up to their sense of hearing and they might also be noticing different smells while they're out there as well and their their sense of sight is a bit inhibited by that blindfold the middle right photo of the gentleman with his hands up to his side. This is um, the only, it's the best photo I could find for demonstrating peripheral vision. So spending as much time inside and maybe on our couches as we did during the pandemic uh, lockdowns, our peripheral vision has probably suffered a little bit and it's a great um, attribute to have and to expand on just for being aware of your surroundings. So even if you're in a busy cafeteria or mall, having good peripheral vision is always a benefit to you. And then of course, being in nature to notice more as you're spending time outside. So what you need to do is um, place your hands in front of you with your arms outstretched, palms together, and then wiggle your fingers as you slowly separate your arms out to your side. And when you get to the point point where you are very close to not seeing your hands anymore. Um, you're looking forward for this entire time, by the way. When you can't see your hands anymore, you slow down and then you just kind of 
bring your hands just to the furthest point that you can get them where you can still see them. And for me, I actually have better peripheral vision to my left than to my right. So that's something I can work on is kind of stretching out my arms gradually and trying to develop that wider sense of peripheral vision. So you can call that owl eyes and it's something that you can do when you're just sitting in a park or sitting in a line and the kids are kind of bored and then you can practice it outside and then they can use that for the fox walk, which Arthur is demonstrating demonstrating um, and I'm going to actually talk about that in the next slide but Arthur uh, he was kind of embarrassed about taking this photo but he's demonstrating the stance that you want to have for the fox walk and again that will be in the next slide finally Talbot's game which is the bottom right this looks like a group of hikers but what they're actually doing is walking along until one leader uses a code word like stop or freeze or notice or focus or whatever you want to set up with your kids and again this is something you can do in nature to help them notice more but also something that you can do in a mall I like to think of this as your James Bond or Jason Bourne training where you're noticing all of your surroundings you know those scenes in the movies where they're like exit door on the right and security camera top left <laughs> so they start to notice birds and maybe a little rodent running under under the grass by using this skill so Talbot's game I don't know where the name came from but basically one leader calls out the code word to, for everyone to stop and close their eyes everyone has to freeze and then the leader asks questions like um, what color of shoes is the person to your left wearing what direction were the clouds traveling in we just passed a tree did you see the bird in the tree um, what direction did the car in front of us just turn things like that it can be anything in your surroundings the answers they come up with can be really funny and then when they have to open their eyes and find out the actual answers if they were incorrect seeing the actual answer actually imprints that on their memory so you're actually almost taking a snapshot in your mind of your surroundings and they will remember their surroundings longer so this is a great thing to do if you go somewhere special and you want them to remember it and not just by photos on their camera, but actually something they can carry with them in their minds for a long time. So that's called Talbot's game and it's a lot of fun. So back to the fox walking, here's Arthur again demonstrating the stance. So um, I've put a link here to, um, I think he's called Animal Dave, and he's done a five minute video that you can check out at that link on how to do the fox walk. Um, and he kind of ramps it up to different levels, but basically you want to start toe to heel. So you put the balls of your um, foot down behind your toes first, and then roll on the outside of your foot to your heel every time you take a step. And by doing that, you're testing your steps each time to make sure that there's nothing noisy that's going to distract um, maybe you're trying to sneak up on a deer to take a look at it without it seeing you or a bird or um, you know in earlier times before shoes this is actually how we walked to sneak up on prey or to sneak away from a predator so again um, it's kind of a fun thing that you can incorporate anytime you're out on a hike with your family or just when you're sitting around waiting for something you can practice this and it's a great skill when you're out in nature if you do see something really cool to walk this way and then your upper body you want your arms just at your side and still not um, swinging at your sides like we tend to do and you want your head up your eyes open and again trying to not just focus on the tunnel vision of what's forward in front of you but opening your eyes to that peripheral vision and walking this way is a very intentional slower way of moving through the forest or other habitats to notice as much as possible around you so it's a great nature appreciation way of being in nature so let's talk about those hikes further on in the presentation I have a whole list of different areas that you can explore and of course day hikes in our area or overnight hikes if you're lucky enough to be a backpacker um, are extraordinary we have world-class hiking here but again we're coming into the hottest part of the year and some kids don't do well in the heat and so maybe you want to slow it down with some other ways of exploring so certainly on colder days when they will enjoy it getting out in the cool breeze and enjoying day hikes is a lot of fun um, and a great way to explore and be fit with your family um, but there's other ways that you can uh, sort of coordinate some hikes for your kids so night hikes is another element to our experience of being outside and so often we forget about being outside at night or we're worried about being outside at night but adding that element gives your kids a real sense of excitement <laughs> even pardon me even if they're in an area that they're familiar with so <clears throat> sorry excuse me 
you can send it out with lights or you could string a rope along a familiar driveway or a safe place, a trail through the woods that you're familiar with and you know there won't be any dangers or traffic on. And then you can send them out with just holding onto that rope with no light and have them explore the sounds and the sights and just the experience of being in the woods at night. Um, you can do micro hikes where, again, you set down a rope or toss a hula hoop onto a really small section. And so if it's a hot day and you want to be in the shade, you can throw this down in, in a shaded area and you can try different terrains. Is it a grassy lawn? Is it a leafy part of the forest? And they get down on their bellies or their hands and knees and just explore and share what they found. Those little critters, the little bugs, maybe there's a bit of litter in their area. Is there an anthill or something else cool that's cropped up? Maybe there's some snails sliding on through there. So that's a really fun one to do in a really micro small area. And finally, blind hikes. So using blindfolds to help kids explore, it builds trust. So if your kids have been fighting and you need them to develop that trust in each other while having some fun, this is a great way to do it or just for them to enjoy themselves. So blindfolding one of them, um, you can do a couple of things. You can just lead each other around and um, try to explore your surroundings through other senses, not using your sense of sight, or one partner can take their blindfolded partner to a destination. Maybe it's a tree. The blindfolded person feels that tree, gets a sense of what tree it is, and then they're walked away, and then the blindfold is removed, and they have to go and see if they can explore and find that tree again, just using their sense of touch. And then, of course, they switch off. So um, those are all lots of fun. And I have some resources here for you. So a walking curriculum by Jillian Judson and sharing nature with children. A walking curriculum is a newer resource. Sharing nature with children is a classic. Both have wonderful ideas for sharing hikes and doing different things with your kids while you're out there. So I spoke briefly about nighttime and I wanted to um, embellish on that a little bit. Um, so we have the Blue Water Astronomical Society's um, Astronomy Observatory here at the Outdoor Education Centre. So there's a link in the bottom left and they have coming events where they open it up to the public for viewing nights. So please come and take advantage of this really unique facility and the knowledge of the BIS members. They're so incredible and have such a, a wide diverse knowledge of everything that's happening out in the night sky. So getting out there and enjoying that summer sky, we're so lucky in our area to be basically in dark sky preserves or close to it and seeing things like the Milky Way that people in the cities just don't have the opportunity to see because of the light pollution. And then of course, um, campfires, and doing things like citizen science. So in the evenings, more in the spring, but stretching into about this time of year, there's Project Frog Watch. So if you're near a wetland area and have especially teenagers, but younger kids as well, you can do a little citizen science in the evenings and go out and listen to the chorus of all the different kinds of frogs and toads that we have. It's their mating season in the spring, and you will be surprised at how loud it gets once you really tune into those sounds. And later in August, uh, there's the Perseid meteor, sh meteor shower. So right after the full moon, um, because it's that cycle of the moon this year, it might be a little bit harder to see the meteors, but any evening in those first couple of weeks of August, even late July, if you look up and spend some time just looking at the sky, you will see meteors flying by. So that's always magical to see with your kids. Potions. I put this in here for kids like me who like to muck around. I always loved to muck around in the dirt with things when I was a kid. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory, but the more opportunities you can give them to mix things up and use their imaginations of what these potions will be used for and adding ingredients, maybe like, um, uh, oh, what are they called? Essential oils um, and things found in nature. It's a lot of fun for kids and they can spend hours doing this together. And again, on a hot day, mixing up with water is kind of a cooling activity for them. Just make sure they're obviously avoiding poison ivy and water hemlocks, the two more poisonous plants we have in our area, and also um, not picking rare or endangered plants and ferns that we have or the wildflowers that we have in our area. Um, you can also add food coloring. And if you add something like rubbing alcohol to the water, it can draw out some of the colors that are in those plants as well. So they can diversify their potions a little bit. Storytelling, you don't have to be an expert, but what a wonderful way to connect with your kids, especially in those quieter times. Um, if they're younger, before or after nap time or on a really hot afternoon, you can find people who are storytellers, you can go to public campfires, but you can also 
also just read stories with your kids or make little puppets or stick figures to act them out. Um, one thing that educators will do if they have the resources is actually take the pages out of the books and hang them through a trail and then have an activity that relates to the story at each point on the trail so that as you walk along and you do your story walk, you can act something out or do something active that relates to the story at each stop. So they're moving and experiencing the story for themselves. And if you just put in nature storytelling in Google, all kinds of resources like this come up. But if you want any specific ideas, my email address is at the end. Feel free to contact me. Again, for those hotter days, especially in the afternoons, crafting and using nature in your crafts um, is a really lovely way to connect. I find when kids are focusing on something, they open up more and they tend to talk um, because they kind of forget themselves and it's a really lovely experience to have that time with them. So doing a little bit of leather working and again, if you can connect with anything that the First Nations are offering in terms of workshops, it's a great way to learn about local First Nations culture while doing that with your kids. Um, the top right is something typically for younger students. You can use paint chips or they've used construction paper here just to have them go out and do a bit of a scavenger hunt. It's a twist on a scavenger hunt to find things, the different colors of the paper. Um, the bottom right is bubble uh, making um, forms. So they just took um, florist's wire from the craft shop and formed it around cookie cutters and then um, attached it to a wand and then you just dip it in the soapy water to make fun shaped bubbles. So again, a nice thing on a hot day. And then if you wanna get even more creative, um, I thought this, uh, this kind of artwork might be something fun to do over the course of the summer, maybe once a week, where they can evolve their art skills and also what they're using in their in their nature art. So you take things from nature, you make a mini scene, take a photo of it, and then you can see how their artwork evolves over the course of the summer. And then down in the bottom left, I mentioned crowns. There's lots of um, links on Google to show you how to make flower crowns that are really simple to do and very pretty and a lot of fun. Sit spots. I can't emphasize enough for you how powerful this can be. So you want to choose um, spots to start this with your family that are safe and away from stranger danger and that kind of thing. But you also want to choose spots where you know they can have some privacy and still be safe because you don't want to be hovering them over while they do this, over them while they do this. And then you want your kids and yourself to choose your own sit spots. So this is something I recommend doing as a family, um, but each individual chooses when and how long they do this for. So once you've chosen your sit spot, it is a place that you can retreat to and you can do what you like there. You can just sit and observe nature. You can think on something that you want to spend more time thinking about. Um, like these girls are doing, you can sketch or read, but just sitting out in nature, invariably you're going to get distracted by what's around you and have some really cool nature observations, especially if you revisit this spot over and over again. Um, but also parents Parents report that their kids really open up to them, especially if parents are also doing their sit spots. And you come back at the end of the day, you share your stories of what you saw or thought about at your sit spot, and they can relate to you, you can relate to them because you're all doing the same thing, but it's a powerful experience just being out there and having that time on your own. And it's one of those things, um, you might have seen the meme earlier, if you're stressed, you should spend time in nature, um, but if you're really worried, you should spend more time in nature. Um, always getting out there is going to clear your head and, and help you get perspective on things and that's really important for our kids as well. I didn't want to leave the teenagers out so I've incorporated some games. Tug of War, one of my favorites when I was about 12 or 13. My school actually had a team and we all joined and it was so much fun. Again doing some citizen science so there's a lot of opportunities for teens to get involved in projects. Um, not only things like Frog Watch um, and Recording Turtles, Project Feeder Watch, Recording Birds, but also helping with projects like removing Phragmites or the big elephant grass from wetlands. Um, we always think that if we enjoy under this sense of love of nature in our kids that they're going to grow up to protect it. The research is actually showing now that they need some guidance and some um, mentoring on how to advocate for nature and to be good stewards and activists to protect nature. So their teen years is the perfect time to do that. Um, here we've got a couple of photos of selfies. So if that's all you can do to get your kids out of nature, that's great. Offer them 
opportunities to be in beautiful places and get really cool shots of them and their friends. They love that. They're sharing. And then maybe it'll encourage other kids to get out to these cool places as well. And then adding that element of adventure. So whether it's bouldering or rock climbing or doing some adventure racing, teens are at that age where they need to test their limits and they need to do it safely. So things that appear risky but are managed control risks are great because it helps them test their boundaries in a really safe way and develop those risk management skills in themselves as well. And then you might be wondering about the top left photo. I could only get one of a guy doing this in a gym, but what he's doing is mimicking animal movements. And this is something that's actually evolved into a workout for people, but it also has roots in nature appreciation and learning the stride and straddle of animals, how they move, um, how they move when they're hunting as compared to when they're relaxed and just walking along as compared to when they're running from a predator. If you can get into the bodies of those animals and really understand how they move, then you're developing a greater sense for nature. So I've got a couple of links here. The top one is just um, various ideas for games and things you can do with teens outside. The bottom one is a really funny short video of a guy practicing different animal movements. It's not exactly what I intended in the top photo, but I just stumbled across it and it's really funny. So you might want to check that out. Um, so again, the citizen scientist and incorporating tech. So if your kids are just so tied to their phone, but you still want to get them outside, these are options for you. So Frog Watch I've mentioned, and there is an app for that. Um, the middle right icon is for geocaching. So um, you're probably familiar with geocaching. There's an app now that helps you find the geocaches around your area, and then you can go out and explore and do some trail hiking and drop off little trinkets at the geocache and see what somebody else left for you. The Seek by iNaturalist app is something you can use to identify things in nature and record sightings. I'm a bit a bit hesitant to record rare plants. We just had some rare plants dug up in Oliphant last night um, before I did this presentation. So I'm always leery about identifying where rare things are, um, but it can be used to help you identify things for sure. And that's really helpful to learn about your surroundings. And then the middle left is Starry Night Pro. So again, for doing some stargazing, you can download this app onto your phone and then you just hold it up to the night sky and it tells you everything about what you're looking at. Finally, I would just say follow their lead. We had a former staff member who used to say, you know, as long as in the three days here, the kids have a chance to chase, hide and scream, they go home happy. And I would add climb and play in the mud to the list as well. Um, so the top game, and it doesn't have to be this formal, but run and scream is the top game. And it's actually a traditional First Nations game where um, people compete and they take a deep breath and run in a straight line for as long as they can scream. And when they run out of breath to scream, they stop, put their marker down, and then the next person has to see if they can beat that. Um, so you would be surprised at the hours of fun kids can have. They love to scream. Um, chasing, running, tag games, hide and seek, sardines, all of those games are always a lot of fun if you have a group of kids or with your family. Playing in the mud, we've talked about, it can be gardening, it can be building sandcastles, or it can be getting right in there like this little guy. And climbing, <coughs> excuse me. Sometimes we're leery about having our kids climb trees. At the OEC, we have an apple tree that fell over a number of years ago, and it probably looks horrible to people who don't understand what it's for, and they come through seeing this tree on the ground. But it's our climbing tree. It's very low to the ground, but it does give kids that experience of being able to climb something. And so you're developing their risk management skills again, their understanding of danger and how they can cope with that. So helping them along at the first, making sure they have four points of contact, and not just saying, be careful, but asking them, what's your plan? What are you going to do if you get up there and you need to come back down? At every step, checking with them that they have a plan of escape for getting back down and making sure that they're balancing their body. So each side is kind of hanging over a branch if they just want to sit there so they're well balanced. All of those things are important skills for them. So I would encourage when you're around and you can help them out, giving them chances to climb a tree or climbing structures or whatever the case may be. So very briefly, and again, you can stop the slideshow at any point or come back to this. I wanted to list for you some of our natural areas. So these are nearby nature areas of all different kinds. Lots of trails and wetlands and cave systems even to explore. And then we're blessed with lots of national and provincial parks around Grey Bruce. And of course, the conservation authorities, and this is only some of them. So 
Um, you might want to make it a goal to come and visit all of these places this summer and work your way through the lists in the next couple of summers or just tick a few of them off and, and see a new place. And don't forget to let kids be bored. That is how creativity is born. That's how they start to spark their own interests and think, oh, what can I do and pick up something new? So having that time to be bored in summer is just as essential as any programmed time where we're keeping them busy. I wanted to just share before we go a couple of resources with you. These are great books. Um, the first one, The Big Book of Nature Activities, is written by two outdoor educators that were in a similar position to mine at Camp Kawartha. And it is um, wonderful, divided up by the seasons and gives you all kinds of ideas and um, sort of key features to watch out for characteristics of each season. Coyote's Guide to Connecting with Nature, that is where a lot of the sensory awareness games that I've shared with you today have come from. And Born to be Wild, so this is specifically a book for families and getting out into nature with kids, so that um, highlights things to do as a family. If you have any questions, I would love to hear from you. I am away midsummer, but um, before and after that, I am available. And we always also post things to our Facebook page all summer long. So you might get some ideas or spark some interest in your kids by looking at those as well. So please give us a follow on Facebook. I hope that you have found this inspiring today and um, has perhaps given you a bit of a different way to look at your time in nature. I want to thank you for joining me and hanging in there and really encourage you to get out this summer. It's so worth it. Please enjoy, be safe, have a great time. And if you ever want to get in touch and share with us what you did, I would love to hear your stories. Thank you very much and have a great summer.